descending through thick clouds. Anset New Zealand Flight 703 slams into a hill. It was just an almighty crash. Horrendous sound. Anset 703, do you read? Those lucky enough to survive the crash find themselves stranded. There's no signals at all and they're off radar. And facing the possibility of freezing to death. Hypothermia would have been a major problem. Once investigators finish piecing together the clues. There it is, clear as day. It was obvious that there was a malfunction. Their findings lead to an unprecedented charge of manslaughter. This accident should not have happened. It's nine in the morning as ANSET New Zealand Flight 703 cruises towards the city of Palmerston North, New Zealand. Best approach heading is set. They're on heading 250. At the controls is 40-year-old Captain Gary Sotheran, a six-year ANSET veteran with almost 8,000 flying hours. ANSET 703 established inbound. 33-year-old First Officer Barry Brown has more than 6,000 hours. We'll do at 10 miles, and said 703. That was a fairly standard sort of commuter flight, and these two pilots were very, very qualified to fly this plane. There are 18 passengers on board the short flight. William McRory is flying to his company's head office for an early morning meeting. I was working for a plumbing company. I was based in Auckland and they were based in Palmerston North. Do you race? Oh, uh, nah. Never wants to race in my life. Past the time, though. Are you headed home? And then the hostess sat down on the seat in front of me on the, on the um, armrest and just started chatting. She was telling me about her life and I was telling her what I was up to and she was great. Just full of life, full of beans, and uh, had, had her life planned. I'm trying to save enough to buy a house. She was from Christchurch, and I believe that's where she was going to buy her house. She was really excited about that. Captain Southern again. The pilots are flying a Dash 8 100 series, a 40-seat regional liner known for its short takeoff and landing capability. And course bar is active. Check. Flight 703 left Auckland for the one-hour flight to Palmerston North. It's a 250-mile journey south to a region with notoriously unpredictable weather. There was low cloud around the Palmerston North area. So, I mean, it wouldn't have been a great day to fly because of the lack of, of visibility. As we were on approach... Hang on a minute. Then she looked out the window and looked a bit concerned. looked on the other side as well and she said I don't think the landing gear's down on the right side can you check your window the landing gear on the dash 8 is located in the engine's housing on the wings because the wings are on top of the airplane when the landing gear is extended it's clearly visible from the cabin no I can't see the landing gear at all we were looking straight out under the wing pretty much so yeah you would see it alright I could tell that it wasn't extended excuse me Karen Gallagher alerts the pilots. I'll keep an eye on the airplane. What are you doing that? Yeah, okay. In the cockpit, Captain Sotheran and his first officer are already troubleshooting the problem. Right landing gear isn't down. I guess you guys know that. Yeah, we know. Thank you. Uh, alternate gear extension, uh, approach landing checklist, pressurization. When the gear doesn't go down normally, there, every airplane has a checklist to have a backup system. That's required by design. Dash 8 is no exception. It should not be a big deal. We're good. Have everything under control. There's a standard procedure that they're running through. She came back and sat down again on the armrest and said they're just doing a manual reset and they'll have the wheel down in no time. She wasn't stressed, well, not alarmed at all. 
As Flight 703 nears Palmerston North, the pilots follow the procedure for lowering landing gear manually. ASB below 140 knots. It's 140. sitting right there in front of me and the next minute and then i'll have a few days off so i'll probably head down to there was just an almighty crash just horrendous sound and then the sound stopped and we must have lifted off the ground it was just horrible horrible noise all the metal and all the things flying around inside the plane Eventually, we came to a stop, and it was just this strange silence of no more grinding and metal and things happening around me. The impact fractured a vertebra in McCrory's back, but the rush of adrenaline keeps him from feeling the pain. I guess it just clicked into survival mode and didn't really matter what was wrong with me. It just I was alive. To get out of this plane, that was probably the only single thing that was on my mind at the time saw a hole in front of me on the right hand side and saw that as an opportunity to get out. William McGrory has survived the crash of Anset Flight 703, but now fears the possibility of a fire. I assumed that we had uh, crash landed on the tarmac without the wheel down. And any minute now, all the fire engines would be screaming up to us to spray all the foam on and make sure we didn't get fire. McCrory suddenly realizes he's nowhere near the airport and has no idea where he is. I just looked back and thought, hell, um, we're in a paddock somewhere in the hills. And that's when I went back to the plane because there was people starting to come out through the holes in the sides. And I went back to assist. There were some people pretty badly injured. Some of the passengers were still unconscious. Up in the cockpit, the two pilots had survived but were pretty badly injured. Passengers still trapped in the wreckage are in urgent need of medical help. NSAT 703, NSAT 703, this is Palmerston Tower, do you read? In the airport's tower, controller Tony Chapman tries to contact NSAT Flight 703. I don't know where they are. There's no signals at all and they're off radar. Well, the emergency services were ready to go. There were, there's firefighters at Palmerston North Airport. But they didn't know where the plane was exactly. To make matters worse, it's extremely cold and windy. Survivors need to find a way to keep warm until help arrives. I thought, hell, we need some we need some gear to get everyone warm. There must be blankets. Or maybe there's some bags at the back. You know, we can just get some jerseys or jumpers or shirts or whatever just to get people warm. But there was nothing, nothing at all to keep us warm. We're out in front of the nose now, which was facing back the way we came. I saw my little briefcase, so I grabbed that and opened it up, knowing full well that my phone was in there. 1995, not many then saw it and it was still working. They rang 111 and they said, what emergency do you need, uh, ambulance, fire or police? And I said, send the whole bloody lot. We're going to play crash, send everything. And she immediately changed her tone and, and said, just hang up and we'll get back to you. You're looking for a white twin engine prop plane. We're flying west along Manawatu Gorge, heading towards the airport. Flight 703, last reported being on final approach for runway 25, could now be anywhere in a 150 square mile area. Everyone was huddled together to try and keep warm as the shock was really setting in at this stage. Hypothermia would have been concern for the passengers who had survived. The ones that were injured in particular, the last thing you want is to be exposed to the cold. For the survivors of ANSET 703, time is running out. ANSET New Zealand Flight 703 has crashed somewhere in the hills around Palmerston North. Passenger William McCrory anxiously waits for the emergency operator to call back. Did he say where they were? Okay, did you get a number? The operator has notified Palmerston North's tower of McCrory's call. Perfect. Thank you. Put a witness called in, said he saw the crash. They had been told... Hello? ...that I saw the crash. Um, and they didn't know that I was actually in the crash at the time. So I straightened them up on pretty quickly. 
Witness it? No, I was on the bloody thing. William, whatever happens, do not hang up the phone. You have to stay on the phone with me. Okay, okay. The person from the control tower said we need to know where you are. Can you give us some descriptions of, of what's around you? Yeah, we're on a hill. It could be a farm. It's freezing cold. The passengers who had survived, of course, would be going into shock, and it was very cold for them, and that could have had unfortunate consequences. Okay, do whatever you can to keep everybody warm. Survivors build a makeshift shelter from the wreckage to protect themselves from the howling winter wind. It had been snowing the day before, so the, the cold was all there. It was just a horribly bitter day. All right, I'll, I'll see what we can find. Can you see if you can find some kind of landmark, anything that can help them find us where we are? How long is your battery going to last? About an hour. Okay, good. Don't hang up. The passenger who'd come to help me said, uh, I'll, I'll have a look around. So he went off up the, some time later and then he said, there's a big holding pen for sheep up the hill further. We're next to a, a very large sheep holding pen. Wood, maybe 30 metres long. Okay, William. Some of the rescuers who were listening to this conversation uh, someone recognised it and knew where to go. Looks like they're near the Buckley Stockyard up by Holblock Road. One of them knew that the only holding pen of that size anywhere around that area was so-and-so's farm. With the location of the crash roughly pinpointed, rescuers make their way to the scene. One rescue helicopter pilot described it as flying in the inside of a nymph bottle uh, to give you an idea of flying up in the cloud. Helicopter. That's good, William. Getting closer. There it is. There, there it is. I remember the helicopter coming up through the cloud, and and I saw its lights hidden for us. It was just incredible. I'll never forget that feeling of seeing those lights and the, the sound of the helicopter. Okay, William. You can hang up now. Thank you. And that's when the adrenaline stopped pumping and I started feeling the pain and the cold and the misery that everyone else was going through. Flight 703 has crashed into a hill 10 miles from the airport at Palmerston North. 15 passengers and both pilots have survived. Tragically, three passengers and flight attendant Karen Gallagher are killed. We were very, very lucky that 17 of us survived. I think so sadly for those that did lose their lives, the hostess and the others that died on that day was um, so unnecessary. Investigators from New Zealand's Transport Accident Investigation Commission, the TAIC, are quickly on the scene. At the time, it was massive news. There's not many plane crashes uh, in New Zealand, and particularly uh, in this case because there were so many survivors. Well, definitely hit more than once. Because the plane was manufactured in Canada, Larry Vance from the Canadian Transport Safety Board is sent to New Zealand to assist with the investigation. It was a main fuselage piece that was spread, they were spread out over the rolling hills. The land was sloped, so it was pretty strewn about. Right here, the nose wheel hits first. The marks on the ground tell investigators that the plane's forward landing gear wheels hit the ground first. The fact that the nose wheel hit first and then the rest of the aircraft followed told us that the aircraft was flying somewhat level. It wasn't going nose first into the ground. The most critical clue is the one that's missing. Our tire tricks. The ground where the right landing gear should have touched down is undisturbed. What we saw from ground markings, it was entirely consistent with the fact that the right landing gear was not extended. The marks on the ground show that Flight 703 was flying level when the forward landing gear hit the ground, but the right main landing gear was not extended. It 
In the cockpit, investigators find evidence that the pilots attempted to lower the landing gear. We saw that the landing gear selector was down. We saw that the emergency landing gear selector was being used. So we knew they were dealing with a landing gear problem simply by looking in the cockpit. Landing data, altimeters, tanks, belt smoking, airspeed below 140 knots? It's 140. Landing gear selected down. Yep. Landing gear alternate release door fully open, which it is. The alternate method should have lowered the gear. For some reason, the plane hit the ground less than a minute later. Yeah. We had two main questions. The first one was, why did the landing gear not extend? And the second one was, why did the pilots fly the aircraft into the ground? Investigators need to examine the wreckage of ANSET 703 to determine why the pilots were unable to get their landing gear down. But the muddy terrain is presenting a challenge. It was virtually impossible to get equipment onto that site. It would just slip and they would get stuck and slide down hills and so on. Vance comes up with a solution. They had a huge helicopter owned by Russians. What we suggested to them that they do is get a big long cable and put the cable through the fuselage. The ribs were in good enough condition that they would basically hold the weight of that fuselage. They brought that helicopter in on a 200 foot long line and they lifted that fuselage up all in one piece. Officers are able to examine the right landing gear to understand why it didn't come down. Right landing gear doesn't come down. Start the alternate procedure, and then slam into a hill, eight and a half miles from the runway. First question is, what went wrong with that gear? What we were thinking is, there's really only a couple of things that can keep that gear from extending. Hard to tell why it didn't come down. Vance is joined by Jim Donnelly, a maintenance engineer from de Havilland, the Dash 8's manufacturer. It was obvious that there was a malfunction of the right main landing gear to extend, so we needed to look at what may have influenced the, uh, the landing gear system operation. When the landing gear is up, a latch holds a roller on the gear's leg in the retracted position. When pilots lower the gear, an actuator moves the uplock latch to release the roller, allowing the landing gear to extend. This is probably where the problem was. Well, when we got to the hangar, we could actually have a better look. We had better lighting and uh, more controlled climate. And everything pointed to the right main landing gear uplock actuator and the uplock actuator latch. Latch is definitely showing signs of wear. When we visually examined the uplock latch, really didn't notice a great deal. However, you could feel a very slight detent on the latch itself where the roller sat. Over time, the roller wore a small groove into the right side latch. It was enough to prevent it from sliding into the down position. It was similar to what you would find if you got your car stuck on ice and you started spinning your tire. And the, the, the tire would wear itself down a little bit of a dip down into the ice. And once you get one of those, of course, it's awfully hard to get out of. Here's another. Landing gear fails to extend. Yeah, it definitely was an issue. Investigators dig through the Dash 8's history. The issue with the uplock actuator where uh, was well documented on early model Dash 8's. A number of operators experienced it. And the inset fleet sure had its share of problems. Both are Dash 8's by the looks of it. ANSET New Zealand's Dash 8s had been experiencing landing gear failures for years. The problem became so widespread that de Havilland offered airlines a modified uplock mechanism designed to overcome the problem. It was found that a change of material would be of benefit to prevent these issues, and it would be a harder material, something that didn't have the same wear properties. Just the left side. Gotcha. Thanks for that. 
They replaced the mechanism on the left side, but we're waiting on parts for the right. ANSET only replaced the uh, left up block actuator because that is where they experienced the majority of their issues. But all of these gear problems were easily dealt with. In every case, the pilots used the alternate method to lower the gear. And they all landed safely. If the gear didn't lower normally, pilots could pull a handle in the cockpit that manually disengaged the latch so that the gear can drop into position. The alternate system is 100% reliable. There has never been an issue with the alternate landing gear extension system failing to lower a landing gear. But evidence from the cockpit wreckage reveals the first officer didn't pull the handle hard enough to release the landing gear. We saw that the handle that is normally pulled uh, was partially pulled. Failing to lower the landing gear is unusual, but it doesn't explain why the pilots of ANSET Flight 703 slammed into a hill just a few miles from the airport. Investigators need to know what was happening inside the cockpit. You're looking to see who's actually flying the airplane, who's monitoring the altitude, who's doing the callouts. This is what investigators have to look at. The pilots of ANSET Flight 703 have suffered severe head trauma and are unable to be interviewed. It's a major setback. Not below 4600 to start off with. Not below 3000 at 9 miles. Below... Investigators now depend on the cockpit voice recorder to uncover the cause of the crash. Ansep 703, stop descent at 6000 feet for the VOR DME approach runway 25. Stop descent 6000 for approach 25, Ansep 703. The approach to runway 25 at Palmerston North involves making a right turn 14 miles from the airport and approaching the runway from the east. Everything seemed to be pretty well nominal uh, until they, they got on final approach. Not below, four, not below 2500 at 7 miles. Yep. And 1600 at 5 miles. Because of the steep terrain surrounding the airport, the pilots need to hit prescribed altitudes at specified distances from the airport. And it's right on the limits, so we've got to stick to that. 3,000 at 9, 2,500 at 7, 1,600 at 5. They knew their minimums. The recording shows that the pilots knew their minimum altitudes throughout the descent. No, no flags. Missed approach heading is set. We're on heading 250. Check. Enset 703 established inbound. Flight 703 makes the final turn and reports flying on a heading towards the airport. Enset 703, roger. Contact Palmerston Tower at 10 miles. We'll do at 10 miles, Enset 703. Also, second place. Okay. With their minimums, they're 13 miles out, no course. And in two and a half minutes, at the ground. Gear down. Say again. Gear down. Yep. Select it. And on profile, hang on. Fraction low. Check. Flaps 15. Oh crap. Oh look at this. I don't want that. Sounds like they just noticed the gears and down and locked. Okay, yeah, that's not good. Okay, so uh, she's not locked. Alternate uh, landing gear? Seemed to be up of it. Huh? Alternate extension. Do you want to grab the QRH? Yep. Captain Sotheran instructs his first officer to run through the alternate procedure which is set out in the plane's quick reference handbook. Checklist is designed to make sure the gear does come down, so ultimately it will come down and then you can land. Whip through that one, see if we can get out of the way before it's too late. Yeah, living and a half miles out. Gonna have to move it to get that gear down. I'll keep an eye on the airplane while you're doing that. Yeah, okay. Separation of duties. 
Captain Flies, on the AFL, President Karen Gallagher. Yeah, we know. Thank you. Alternate gear extension, uh, approach landing checklist pressurization. Just skip down to the actual applicable stuff. When the captain asked the first officer to skip over those steps, they had the authority under asset to do so. And so this is this something that's, again, not unusual, was not breaking a rule. But the crew is rushing, rushing to get this checklist done, which they needed to do if they wanted to to land the airplane. Yeah, uh, landing data, altimeters, tanks, uh, belt, smoking, airspeed below 140 knots. It's 140. Landing gear selected down. Yep. Yeah. Landing gear alternate release door open. The first officer would open a door in the ceiling and that exposes the handle. You pull it until you can't pull it anymore and the landing gear drops. And then it free falls to the down and lock position. So far, so good. A few more steps. The gear will be down and locked with about four and a half minutes to spare. Ends at 703, established finals upon us in north. Insert 703, that's understood. And insert this handle. Insert handle till... First Officer Brown is struggling with the procedure. If there was any chance that the landing gear would not go down to the lock position, there's a hand pump down in the floor that you open another door in the floor, you put a handle in, make a selection and you start pumping. And operate until the main gear locks. Give it a step. He's fussing with the pump handle. He hasn't even pulled the gear release yet. Oh, there. And operate until the main gear locks. You're supposed to pull the handle. <laughs> it's actually got that after that. Yeah. It's pulled. They pulled it. But not all the way. That's why the gear was still up when they hit. The plane is only a few hundred feet from the ground, but the pilots still haven't lowered the right landing gear. Three, three, pull up. Three, three, pull up. Could one missed step on a checklist have doomed the passengers and crew of Flight 703? Alternate landing gear, alternate extension. You want to grab the QRH? Yep. I'll keep an eye on the airplane. What are you doing there? Yeah, okay. Investigating dangerously low. The captain clearly said. And I'll keep an eye on the airplane. Doesn't sound like he did that. There are two people in the cockpit. The captain was to fly the airplane, but now he's involved in the checklist. Oh, yeah. And operate until the main gear locks. You're supposed to pull the handle. The voice recording has revealed that instead of monitoring the airplane as he said he would, the captain was helping his first officer with the landing gear checklist. In any emergency, somebody has to fly the airplane and keep the airplane where it needs to be. Let's see the approach profile. The flight data shows exactly when Flight 703 began to stray from its planned descent path. They were approaching their minimum altitude when the gear hangs up. And they keep descending. Past. The data shows that Flight 703 kept dropping lower and lower until it was almost 1,400 feet too low. And the aircraft started to descend quite quickly down below what would be a desirable glide path. And the captain didn't notice that. He was paying more attention to what the co-pilot was doing because the co-pilot was struggling trying to get the landing gear sequence right. It should have been descending at about 580 feet per minute. It's dead. They were descending at around 1,200 feet per minute. Why is that? The captain should have put some more power to the engines and adjusted the nose attitude to decrease his rate of descent. That's what should have been happening. Okay, right here. The engines are cut back to flight idle. Course bar is active. Check. Going down to 4,600 now. Captain Sotheran brought his engines to flight idle to aid his descent, and then left them in that position for more than a minute. During that time, Flight 703 descended below the recommended altitude. The captain eventually increased engine power, but not enough. 
and flaps 15, and up to 33%. And back to flight idle, up uh, 10%. Not giving it a lot of power. He allowed the airplane to get way below the profile. He didn't notice that because he, again, he was busy, he was distracted. The co-pilot didn't notice because he's trying to deal with his checklist. So nobody noticed the airplane went descending below profile. But there is a device on the Dash 8 that should have warned the pilots that they were rapidly approaching the ground. The Ground Proximity Warning System, or GPWS, means closing speed. If the plane is getting too close to the ground, or descending too quickly, a warning sounds, advising the pilots to pull up. Okay. Let's listen to what they heard in the cockpit. Investigators listen for the warning sounds from the GPWS. You're supposed to pull the handle. It's actually got that after that. <laughs> it's pulled. Marine, Marine. Pull, pull. There it is, clear as day. Marine, Marine. Pull, pull. Went off 4.5 seconds before impact. Not a lot of time to react. The voice recording reveals that the warning system didn't give the pilots much time to pull up and save the plane. It was quite obvious to us that they had made an attempt to start an immediate climb away. Terrain, terrain, pull up. They had started to put on power. They had obviously brought the nose up from the aircraft's previous nose down attitude. Computer simulations show that the GPWS on the Dash 8 should have provided a warning well before Flight 703 hit the hill. 17 seconds. That's more like it. The pilots would have had ample time to avoid a collision. Had it been 17 seconds, I suspect the airplane would have cleared the hill. It would have been a scary moment, but they would have cleared the hill. There's a big difference between 17 seconds and 4.5 seconds. Sure is. A four and a half second warning before you hit the hill isn't uh, particularly helpful. The team now wonders why the crew of Flight 703 got a late warning from their GPWS. Investigators have recovered the GPWS computer from the wreckage of ANSET Flight 703. We didn't know if there was anything wrong with that system, but we knew it warranted looking at further. This checks out. No problems at all. The unit appears to be in good working order. Investigators know the GPWS didn't warn the pilots until it was too late. Did something interfere with the... What do we know about this? The issue was brought up about the nearby telecommunications tower and whether or not that had uh, any potential for interference with the operation of the airplane. What do you got? It's a radio transmission tower. Signals are in the 800 to 900 megahertz range. Those frequencies wouldn't affect the uh, radio altimeter. The main reason that we ruled out the telecommunications tower very quickly was that it was not in the same frequency range at all that's used by the GPWS, two entirely different frequencies. It's been painted. To prevent any disruption to reception, the antenna for the radio altimeter is marked with the words, do not paint. It appears ANSET ignored that. The GPWS uh, antenna sends and receives radio altimeter signals as the aircraft passes over the ground. It was painted. It shouldn't have been painted. We had no idea what this meant to the operation of the system. The non-metallic paint used would not inhibit radio signals. That's not it. They're running out of leads. It's got to be the software. 
Investigators determined that a software glitch prevented the GPWS from getting accurate altitude readings. As the plane descended faster than normal over unusually hilly terrain, we concluded that probably the radio altimeter missed a beat or two as they were approaching the undulating terrain, that it just dropped out for whatever uh, one or two hits, enough to, uh, to cause it to, to give only a four or five second uh, warning. Uh, landing gear alternate release door open, which it is. But the failed GPWS doesn't answer the investigation's most pressing question. Why didn't the pilots discontinue their approach while they struggled with their gear? Clear now to assess the landing gear issue here. 12 miles out. That only gives them about five minutes to get the gear down and land. Why not go around and buy some time? Good question. Time is your friend, and if you don't have enough time, it's your enemy. So you want to make sure you give yourself time, because these procedures do take time to lower the gear. question is, why did it continue? Investigators now realize that the entire sequence of events put in motion by the failed gear could have been prevented if... They're just going around. Oh, crap. Yeah, look at that. I don't want that. Yeah, that's not good. Okay, so uh, she's not locked. Alternate uh, landing gear? Alternate extension. You want to grab the QRH? Yeah. Just whip through that one, see if we can get it out of the way before it's too late. The team believes Captain Sotheran's decision to continue the approach while trying to lower the gear was a tragic mistake. When this landing gear did not come down, the pilot should have stopped their approach right away. They should have said, we're going to go somewhere and hold, and we're going to get the landing gear down. Oh, yeah. And operate until the main gear locks. You're supposed to pull the handle. <laughs> but instead, Captain Sotheran made the decision to continue his approach to Palmerston North. In human factors terms, it's called continuation bias. Continuation bias means that you've got a plan to do something. Other things come up to show you that plan may not be as good as you hoped but you don't accept those other things. His resolve to continue the approach proves deadly. Marine, Marine, pull up. 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 In their final report, investigators fault Captain Sotheran for not making proper power adjustments, for losing track of his altitude, for not focusing on flying the airplane, and for continuing the approach while troubleshooting the landing gear. You're dead to yourselves. A landing gear issue should not cause an airplane accident. Flight crews are trained to overcome this type of emergency. This accident was about the performance of the pilots. This accident should not have happened. And said New Zealand revised its operations manual following the accident. Pilots are now instructed to discontinue their approach and resolve any abnormal situations before attempting to land. What I learned from this accident was, give yourself time. It's not a critical emergency. It's something you can do in an organized way, but you need time. In the year 2000, in an unprecedented move, Captain Sotheran is charged with manslaughter for operating an aircraft in a careless manner. After a six-week trial, six years after the accident, a jury finds him not guilty. It was a grueling trial for the captain. He never flew for ANSET again. McGrory bears no ill will towards the crew of ANSET Flight 703. Yes, there was part of the error, but I did not uh, at any time blame the pilots for the crash. It's, it's a whole host of things on the day that came together, like the perfect storm. At the time after the crash, I learned to appreciate life in general. And I often have to pinch myself and say, hey, smell the roses, tell people you love them again, and remember that one instant you can be here, the next instant you can be dead. So um, it, it's been good for me in, in that respect, that uh, it makes you appreciate what you have got.